All right, so let's talk encoding. This is the last part of this set of video notes. So all that encoding is, is just how we get information into our brains and end up storing it as memory, okay? Some information is going to be automatically processed for us, okay? So for example, your route to school. Eventually that will become a scenario where it's just automatically established. But novel information, so things that are not necessarily all that easy to, you know, keep in mind. So like a friend's new cell phone number or, you know, a new acquaintance's name or something along those lines, that's going to require attention and effort on our part. So when we talk about information being automatically processed, that means that there is automatic processing occurring in the encoding process. That was a lot of process words. That's going to happen a lot during this set of notes. Um, the novel information, though, that requires attention, this is effortful processing. So we'll get into both of those concepts right now. Automatic processing is when a lot of information is processed effortlessly, okay? So it doesn't require a whole lot from us. So things like space. We notice spacing and placement of objects without us really even having to think about it, okay? So when you're reading a textbook and you automatically encode the place of a picture on a page, um, you know, when you're required to go back and think about that information again, you realize you just kind of took it in just like that and you weren't even thinking about it. Um, you know, another thing would be time. Unintentionally speaking, we end up keeping track of when events take place in a day. So, um, you know, for example, the end of the bell. We always know the time frame for that. Most of the time, you guys will end up packing up your books and stuff within about a two minute range of that because you know the class is about to end. Frequency is another thing. For whatever reason, it's very easy for us to, without any level of effort, keep track of things that have happened to us quite frequently. Okay, so if you have, um, for example, the, the hiccups early on in the morning and then it happens again to you right around the afternoon time, and then it happens again in the evening. You notice that is automatically the third time that day that you've had the hiccups. So those are what we're talking about when we say automatic processing pieces. Automatically speaking, it's difficult for us to turn off this processing level because we don't notice that we're doing it, specifically with space, time, and frequency. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Now with effortful processing, on the other hand, um, this is when information gets committed to our memory because it requires a lot of effort from us. So this is where rehearsal and things like that can become very helpful in attempting to store information. Effortful processing has a tendency to lead to fairly strong and easily accessible memories. Um, and so this is kind of where practice makes perfect, that whole concept is very true with effortful processing. The more that you practice it and kind of learn a concept and rehearse it for yourself, the more likely that it'll stay for you. So some memory effects of effortful processing. Um, you can take a look at things like the next in line effect. Um, when your recall is better for what other people say, but it's not all that great um, just before you in um, you know, that line. So think about when you have to you know, read out loud in class if, or if you know you're going to be the next person in line to um, have to answer a question from you know, a, a reading guide, let's say. You're so worried about the fact that you've got to focus in on um, and present you know, part of a, you know, a reading from a passage or you've got to answer that question and you're concerned about being right. So you're not paying attention to what the person before you is talking about, okay? You're just so focused on you that you end up just not paying much attention for that. Um, another kind of scenario is spacing effect. This is when we retain information um, when our rehearsal is distributed over time. So this means not waiting until the last minute to study. Hopefully that rings true because this is like the 18th time that I've talked to you guys about this, about how you can better prepare and learn how to study for this class. Studies show if you go a little bit, you chunk a tiny bit each night, you'll be more likely to remember the information better than if you cram the night before the test because it's going to be gone very quickly after you take that examination basically. Another scenario is serial position effect. This is when your recall is better for the first and last items in a list. 
but when you get to the middle portions of a list, it's not so good. So an example of this would be if I were to ask you to list off the 44 presidents of the United States. More than likely, it will be very easy for you to remember George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, uh, and the more recent presidents like um, Bill Clinton, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, Barack Obama. But, you know, the presidents in the middle, like Millard Fillmore or um, guys like James Taylor, uh, you know, they're going to not necessarily be as easily uh, established. But when you get to, you know, uh, presidents in the middle like James Polk or uh, Millard Fillmore, most of us wouldn't even remember ever learning about those guys. So that's serial position effect. Now, visual encoding seems to be some of the most powerful, um, particularly when it comes to effortful processing, because it makes it possible for us to see um, and, and that sounds kind of redundant when you're looking at visual encoding, but mental imagery, it's a powerful aid because we are very much a visual generation. We have to see things to really understand them. So um, when we talk about semantic encoding, semantic simply just means the meaning of something. So it would be one thing for me to talk about, uh, you know, diseases of the lungs like emphysema or lung cancer or bronchitis. It's something else for me to show you those images like I do right here. Those are very, very powerful tools in showing you, um, in addition to you know, the meaning of these diseases, and you'll be more likely to remember this information and store it as a result of that, purely because of the imagery that's provided. One way to help us to encode a large amount of information um, or to establish imagery, you know, visual encoding to, to kind of try to take in large amounts of info are through mnemonic devices. Okay, so these use very vivid, vivid images um, to help us encode large amounts of info. And there are three key kinds that I'm going to go through with you right now. One is the method of loci, then there are peg words, and then there is chunking. So let's talk about those. Method of loci is when you imagine moving through a very familiar series of locations and you place, you know, items from a list of things that you need to remember, for example, within each kind of location within that um, series. Okay, so you can see here we've got a list of items to bring to AP Psych and imagining locations in your house. So you've got textbook, paper clips, iPod, note cards, colored pencils, scissors. And then you have these rooms in your house, these locations. So, you know, a way for you to help remember this in operating with the method of loci, you put the textbook in your bedroom. Let's say that you fell asleep last night in your bed, all snuggled up and warm, reading from your best friend your AP Psych textbook. So if you remember thinking about the textbook in the bedroom, you would be more inclined to remember that item purely because you've attached an image to it. Um, you know, paper clips in the bathroom. This is going to sound kind of funny, but let's say you were just sitting in there and you were, I don't know, you were just doing your business and you were fiddling around with a paper clip, just pulling it apart. You'd be more likely to remember it purely because of that silly imagery um, as opposed to trying to remember just this list right here by itself. Okay, so that is method of loci. Another kind of scenario you could use is peg words. Peg words involve you basically using kind of like um, a jingle or some kind of piece of music, something that's very catchy, and you associate that with trying to remember a list of things that you have to get, let's say, for like um, a, I don't know, a grocery store run or something like that. If you can visualize the items as you're going through it, that would be pretty easy too. So, uh, you know, you could put it to a song, you could attempt to, you know, put the items that you need to, let's say, we're right around the holiday season, so jingle bells. Um, another thing you could do is um, use something like this right here, this little jingle. Oftentimes what they use for peg words, they'll do um, a list of numbers and put it with something that rhymes with it. So one is bun, two is shoe, three is 
tree, four is door. And then you've got this list of these four words here. Now, if you could imagine lettuce in between a bun, um, a banana stuck in a pair of shoes, cheese in a tree, and a tomato hanging from a door, you would be able to more easily recognize this. And I know it sounds kind of silly, but if you think about it, one is bun, two is shoe, three is tree, four is door, because those rhyme, it'll be easier for you and you visualize it to put these items, keep them not only in order, but to remember them so that way if you fail to bring your list with you, you'd be able to remember all of those items when you go to the grocery store. Something else to discuss, and we've already talked about it a little bit, is chunking. So this is when you take things into smaller manageable units and you try to organize them accordingly to that. One of the most familiar kinds of chunking pieces out there that you guys are probably well aware of is an acronym. Okay, so this is when you can take like the first letters of items or phrases and you create a new word or phrase or sentence that corresponds to that. So um, some of these mnemonics, the five Great Lakes, for example, you write HOMES, H-O-M-E-S, and those uh, that stands for the first letter of each of the five Great Lakes, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. PEMDAS is, uh, you know, another one of those scenarios um, you could use it as, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, that's one that has been commonly established, so that way you can remember that it is parentheses, exponents, multiply, then divide, then add, then subtract. Okay, and so this is how they carry out that particular math process. If you're trying to remember the colors of the light spectrum, for example, you could write out Roy G. Biv because those are the initial letters of the seven different colors included in the light spectrum, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So these are acronyms and those can very much help to um, take in large amounts of info and um, remember them a little bit more easily. So this is the end of the encoding portion of the notes. Obviously, if you have any questions at any point, please feel free to let me know and we'll be sure to spend a good deal of time in class clarifying a lot of this for you.